I'm Rich Bergel. I'm the current chair of the Smart Partnership, and I'm joined by James Slade of Rewild and um, the, what's your position at Smart again? Capacity Council Chair, and then Jonathan Palmer of WCS, who's the Smart Chief Technology Officer. Um, the format of the session today is we're going to start off with a, a general overview of Smart on the software and what it does, because I think for the Earth Ranger community, that's not um, as well known as it is obviously for, for the Smart community. Um, then James is going to talk a little bit about Smart capacity building efforts, and Jonathan's going to talk about both the the future of Smart and then the potential for collaboration with Earth Ranger and other conservation technologies. Um, before we start, on the table over there, there are copies of the SMART annual report, the current annual report. If you're interested in a hard copy, feel free to grab one. And we also have SMART hats. We're not quite as good at branding as Earth Ranger is, but um, we've got a bunch of SMART hats here. So after the session, anybody who has, asks a question can have a hat. And then also, we have, we'll have a few extras as well. Right. Yeah, you have to stay to the end. Um, so yeah, so smart. Um, I've, I've, I, this isn't news to anybody um, in this audience, but smart was developed in response to the variety of threats facing wildlife and wild places around the world and the limited resources that are available to conservation. And so the smart partnership, which is a, a, a collaboration of several large and small NGOs from around the world, set out to create a tool that provided information that made conservation work better and that allowed the limited resources that are avail available for conservation to be deployed as effectively as possible. Um, and so that's why we created SMART. Hopefully most people in the audience have, have heard of it. Um, it is a free open source, um, fully customizable software to allow for the collection, analysis, and reporting of data that are relevant for the management of protected areas and for other conservation adjacent efforts. Um, it has desktop, mobile, and cloud-based components, which is what I'll be focusing on today. And it's designed to be very easy to use at the kind of at the front lines of conservation um, to be scalable from a single protected area up to a national protected area network, network and to be applicable in a wide variety of different contexts. Um, SMART has been around for about 12 years now, and we're in about 1,200 sites around the world, about 100 countries, and then there are 24 countries that have adopted SMART as their national standard for data collection in their protected area networks. Um, and the goal of all this is to enable adaptive management um, so that data can be collected, analyzed, and then used to inform conservation strategies. So I'm going to run through the, the three main components of the smart software platform. Um, smart desktop is an application that runs on a laptop or desktop computer. Um, it's free. Uh, all, all smart products are free. Um, and you can just download it from the smart website and start using it after you know, figuring out how it all works. Um, it's fully end user customizable, so you can make whatever changes, adjustments, maps, parameters, et cetera, et cetera, that are relevant for, for you, so you don't have to rely on having a developer on staff or, um, or working with anybody. You can do it completely on your own if you want to. Uh, it can function completely offline, um, so it was originally designed um, obviously 10, 10 plus years ago when connectivity was much worse than it is today. Um, and so it can work in a fully disconnected environment. It can work in a, partial, work in a partially connected environment or when you're fully online um, using our, our cloud platform in tandem with desktop and mobile. Uh, you can do things like load multiple custom base maps. You can make your own base maps um, using standard shape files and, and other layers. You can use um, online uh, mapping repositories as well. And Smart's available in more than 10 different languages. Uh, one of the really unique and I think most powerful features of SMART is the data model. So this is how you define what information gets collected in the field and what information is important for you in your conservation area or conservation project. Um, it's fully user configurable, so you can set up the data model however you want to collect whatever information is relevant for you at whatever of detail is important for the kinds of questions that you're trying to answer. Um, it does have multiple different types of data types, so numerical attributes, list attributes, date attributes, a whole a, a wide variety of those, so it's not just text or a number. 
Uh, it does have a built-in global species list from the IUCN. So every single species, the taxonomy is built into, into, the, um, into the data model. So you can turn on and turn off species as you like, but that, make, that makes it easier to both query at different levels of taxonomy. So looking at all mammals or all carnivores or something like that. And then also to compare between data sets because everybody's using a standard um, set of species but that can be adjusted to local a local situation. So if there's a local name for an animal and you want to use that, you can use that, but the, the scientific name is still in the background. Um, and then the data model, in a, you, you can design a very complicated, very sophisticated, very detailed data model, but then we also have a concept of what we call a configurable model, which basically is what ends up on, in, on the mobile app, and you can customize that to be as straightforward, as simple, or as detailed as you want, and that maps directly back to the, the base data model for the database. And you can do things like use all local terms or even a completely different language in the app, and then when it gets downloaded into, onto your main system, it gets translated back into whatever the local language on your, on your main system is. SMART was originally designed around the concept of a patrol, the types of data that SMART uses has, have expanded since then, but a, but a patrol is still sort of the, the fundamental unit. Um, and a big part of the interface is designed around accessing data from individual patrols and then aggregating those together. Um, and it's very easy in the SMART interface to, for example, this is an example of a, a single patrol being visualized. So here's a list of all the patrols that, you, that have been conducted. This is the data, data from an individual patrol. You can see a map of where the patrol went, uh, points where that were data that were collected, and then the details of those data here that you can then you can click on the on the on the dots and, and see those there. And then also if any photos were taken with the mobile app or if recording audio recordings were made with the mobile app, you can see those all in in a single view. Another really compelling component of SMART is the analytical platform. Um, even before the analysis is done, we have a quality assurance module that helps you to clean data to make sure that there are no bad points, that you didn't get a, a bad weird GPS point from somewhere, or that somebody didn't leave the device on when they were going to town or something like that, so you can remove those from the data set automatically. Um, and then the, the analysis, the query component of SMART is, is really, really useful. It's, a, it's a, a drag and drop interface that can allow you to really interrogate the data at whatever level is relevant for you. So you can make maps, tables, calculate statistics, do grids, um, heat maps uh, in, in a really straightforward way that anybody can, who, who is reasonably computer literate can learn how to do in an afternoon or a day. Uh, obviously, it has a lot of depth to it, so you can learn more and more, but you can understand the basics of querying your data, database in a couple of hours, um, and then it allows you to you or your analyst or whoever to sit down and, and really pull out the data that's, that's useful for you. And it also allows for analysis across multiple sites. So if you're working in a network of protected areas, you can analyze the data for a single site, but then you can also aggregate the data from multiple different conservation areas for all, all the conservation areas in, in a whole country or even across the world if you have access to all of those um, in, a very, in, in the same way that you analyze the data for a single site. So it's useful for comparing between sites, comparing, looking at how resources are allocated across a network. The, all the analytics, all the questions, the queries that you build in SMART then can be aggregated together in our reporting tool. And so this allows you to take, to make take, take tables, graphs, statistics, conduct additional analysis, um, put maps and everything together in a, in a standardized format. So you might have a monthly report that a park produces regularly, or every month, I suppose. Uh, you might have a, a patrol report that's generated automatically at the end of each patrol, documenting what happened on, on a patrol, an annual report, et cetera, et cetera. And once these are configured, once the reports are built, it's literally one or two clicks to run it. And then it takes all the data for a month, a year, multiple years, and generates a uh, either a Word document or a PDF that shows all the, all the different things that you have decided are important for your protected area. 
A couple of additional components. So most of that is sort of focused on, on patrols and, and the standard kinds of data that we collect in the context of um, protected area management. But there's a, a number of other functions within SMART that are very useful for, uh, for, for the use in conservation. So we have a dedicated survey plugin. This allows you to design systematic surveys, whether they're transects or point counts or recce's, um, and to design it in SMART. Can collect the data and then import those data into SMART in following that um, that 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 uh, designed formal survey. Um, it can be adapted to any kind of survey methodology, and it integrates with distance. If you're familiar with that, if you want to do more detailed analysis after the fact. Another plugin in SMART is our Profiles plugin. Um, this is ba basically allows you to create. The concept of entities, so you can they can be anything. They could be a person, they could be an individual animal, they could be a water pump, they could be a vehicle or a firearm. Um, and to collect information on those, on those entities and then to look at relationships between them. This was originally designed as an intelligence tool to, to collect informant information, offender information, and then look at relationships between, between them. But it's, but it's generalized now so that it could be used for anything. So in this example here, it's being used in, in Zambia for looking at relationships between different lion individuals, individually identified lions, who they're related to, what's happening with them over time, how their, how their ranges are changing, that kind of thing. Um, and it could even be used for, for, for even more basic things like infrastructure maintenance um, or monitoring. So what's, what, are the, what are the readings from a bunch of pumps or what's the, how much fuel has been put into a vehicle or what's the maintenance that's been done on a, on a given vehicle or something like that. And then there's also a plugin for managing sensors. This is not sensors in the, in the sense that EarthRanger brings sensor data directly in. But for example, um, you can use it for managing a deployment of camera traps where you use Smart to mark where all the, tra all the camera traps are deployed, enter information about um, the last time the SD card was checked or something like that. And then once the data are downloaded from the, from the trap, those can be brought into SMART and then associated with SMART data model values so that the, the information that's visualized from images and camera traps can be included in analysis along with patrol data, along with profile data, that kind of thing. So that's a SMART desktop. Um, the, Smart mobile is how 99.9% .9 of people are collecting data with Smart now. You can manually collect data as well and, and type it in, but it's not recommended. This is, the Smart app um, can be installed either from uh, online from one of the, the Play Store or the App Store, but you can also install it directly from the laptop onto a device. So if you're setting up at a kind of production level, you've got 50 devices that you want to set up, you don't have to put a Google account on all of them, connect them all to the internet, download it from the internet, you can just plug it into your laptop and, and load it directly from, from, your, from your computer. We have a built-in library of icons. Um, I think it's, what, over a thousand icons now um, that correspond to items in the data model. Um, makes it a lot easier when people are entering data to quickly enter, enter information in because they this visually seeing something is a lot easier than reading through it. It also makes it easier for people who's, um, who, who are maybe not fully literate or have trouble with the language that you're using smart in um, to, to still be able to collect data. You can make multiple different forms effectively or different versions of the app and have them on the same mobile device. So you could have a version of the app for patrols or you could have a version of the app for, for scientific research. You could have a version of the app for human wildlife conflict all on the same dev device but collecting different information but then that aggregates into the same database into the same original data model in SMART. We have a kiosk mode, which allows you to lock the device so that it can only run smart mobile. And um, there's a lot of places where if a device is issued to a ranger as a part of their um, formal equipment, you don't want them to be able to get into WhatsApp or put a SIM card in and be able to be calling people. Um, and this prevents you from doing anything other than smart mobile with the app. Uh, and then it also supports dozens of languages. Any Unicode language can be, can be displayed in smart mobile. Mobile has uh, both net mapping and navigation functions. Um, these can fun either be, be fully online, so be, like OpenStreetMaps, you can read those if you have a data collection, if you have data connection, but you can also preload either uh, a web map or create your own custom map in, in Smart Mobile or in 
uh, an Esri product, load that, and then use that on the device. You can upload routes from, um, from desktop. So one of the things I didn't mention, desktop also has a patrol planning feature where you can assign either tar spatial targets or other targets for a patrol, give the, that information to a group of rangers and have them carry out that patrol. The route that you define for that patrol or the points you want them to hit can be uploaded to mobile and then they can use mobile to follow it to, to those locations. As I said, you can make custom base maps, you can, whatever, whatever map you can make in GIS or that you can make in smart, you can put directly onto the device. Um, and yeah, the navigation can be either using the defined routes, like I said, for a patrol, or it can just be on the fly. You can turn on the mapping function and say, I wanna go here, and then it'll give you a straight line and an arrow to follow to, to get there. In addition to the, the manual data collection of, of the, the manual collection of data when you record an observation, Smart also automatically records um, and tags a, a lot of patrol metadata to each observation. So when you start a patrol, you enter in the patrol the patrol leader, the names of all the patrol members, the transport type, um, et cetera, et cetera, the type of patrol, and then all the subsequent ob observations have that information. So you know which patrol, who saw the thing what kind of patrol were they doing? And so that's good for future analysis to know what kind of patrols are more effective or, or who's, who's getting more done, who's traveling more distance. Um, it allows to, smart, smart allows you to collect both incidents and observations. And they, basically that's, we think of it, an observation as one thing that happened and an incident as a collection of things at the same place. So if you find a uh, poaching camp and there's dried meat there and there are drying racks and there's a campfire and there's a, a weapon and there's three people, you can collect all those observations separately, but then they're aggregated together at an incident so you know all those things happen together. Um, and then the app also allows you to collect photos and record audio. Data can be transferred either manually or via the Smart Connect, our cloud platform, which I'll talk about next. Um, and if you do have a connection, you can have either kind of near real-time data being sent from the app um, like every few seconds, or you can have the, app, the data sent when you have a connection, or you can wait until you return to, to base and, and manually plug it in. And then uh, l lastly, with the mobile app, we have uh, what we call Smart Collect. So this is, allows you to collect smart data that's not in the context of a patrol. Um, there's a lot of different uses for this. Um, it's been used for citizen science, for communities to report things to like, you know, like human wildlife conflict. Um, and so like, for example, in, in Zambia, they, they give it to tour operators and tour, operat tour operators record carnivore sightings. Um, they're not on a patrol, they're not recording, it's not counted as law enforcement, they're not recording track logs or anything like that. They're just recording when they see whatever thing of interest. Um, and this can be, down, is, can be uh, set up on one of the app stores, and so it's very easy to circulate. You don't have to have people come into your office and download it from you. So the, la the final component of Smart is what we call Smart Connect. That's our cloud platform. Um, and that allows one or more desktop installs of Smart to talk to each other via a cloud database. This allows synchronization between multiple different in, installs of the of, of smart. So if you have a big park with multiple stations, they can be talking to each other. They can get be getting each other's data. It provides online storage and backup. So if your your headquarters burns down, you don't lose all your data. Um, and we provide and we provide it, it. We will provide hosting for Smart Connect for you for free if you want to. But you can also have Smart. Connect be installed on premise. So you can if you're running your own server, you can have it locally in your national park headquarters or national data center or something like that. And, and you don't necessarily have to use our cloud. You can, you can set it up yourself. So Connects allows remote, da remote data upload from the field, which I mentioned already, um, which can, it's not like Earth Ranger in, in that you're, you're gonna be tracking people in real time necessarily, but it allows you to see observations that are of, uh, that are of interest immediately as soon as they're collected or as soon as they're sent from the field rather than having to wait for the device to come back and be downloaded. 
Connect also allows you to do a lot of the, the analysis and reporting and mapping that's possible in desktop in an online environment. And this is particularly good for, um, manager, for managers or more senior people in, a, in an agency. They don't have to have smart software on their computer. They don't have to know how to use smart software. They just need, they can just have a few links that they click on when they log into Connect Online, and then that'll generate a query or generate a report for them. Uh, this is the alerts map I mentioned. This is what you can configure smart so that so when something of interest is observed and if the data are sent via the internet, it'll populate an online map. And so you can just periodically check, oh, have there been any poaching incidents recorded or is there a, a fence break that needs to be fixed today? Something like that. Uh, as I said, you can run and, ex and export reports online, so you don't actually have to have smart software on your computer in order to have access to those, uh, to those reports once they've been generated in the desktop software. And then what, one of the most powerful things with Connect is that it allows you to administer um, a whole suite of smart installs across a country, for example. So you can be sitting in the headquarters and you can add and remove employees without having to, to go to the, the, an individual site and do that. You can make changes to the data model and that gets pushed to everybody who's using, using the, the software. You can um, create new configurable models, new, new versions of the app and send those out to everybody and they'll get them. Um, and so it's a really great way to from an administrative perspective to manage your whole smart system. Connect is also where we have an integration with EarthRanger. So it's now possible to both send smart data to EarthRanger and view it in EarthRanger and bring and, and visualize EarthRanger data in smart. James is gonna talk about capacity building next, so I won't go into that, um, but we do a lot with capacity building training, um, uh, materials uh, that are all freely available online. Um, and as, I, as I, I think I said at the beginning, the, the flexibility of SMART is, is one of its real strengths and what allows it to be applied in a wide variety of different contexts. So certainly things like law enforcement and threat assessment and staff evaluation, which is what it was sort of originally conceived of for. Um, but increasingly it's being used for, by, by communities for, for their management of natural resources, um, for tracking human wildlife conflict. I mean, even like in this example here for monitoring road maintenance. Um, so it's really an incredibly flexible tool that can al allow you to con collect basically any kind of spatial data that are relevant for conservation. So I'm gonna turn it over to James, who's gonna talk about capacity building. Thanks, Rich. Where are we here? Where is it? Uh -huh. That's sweet. That's right. Yeah, where's my presenter view? Oh, that's right. Yeah, PCs. There we go. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's great to be here. Um, unfortunately for you, you've got me giving this presentation today. It was meant to be given by uh, Dr. Anthony Dancer, who is the Smart Partnership Capacity uh, Chief Capacity Officer, but he's arriving a little bit late, so he threw me under the bus, and uh, I get to do this for a change. So that's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of sort of the smart capacity element and what we've been trying to work towards, as well as um, give you a little bit of an idea of what the future of that looks like. Now, going back to when I first got uh, involved with smart, and I've been involved for many years, probably too many, depending on who you ask here, but there was two things that struck me initially. And one of those was, you've got a series of eight conservation organizations that are collaborating on almost a daily basis to create not just the software, but also the whole infrastructure, the whole support network around this. And to me, going back to you know, sort of the mid 2000s or so, that was remarkable because we hadn't really seen anything like that. The second thing that really struck me was when I downloaded the, the, the program for the first time to use in Northern Zimbabwe and to apply it to our site, as soon as I opened that manual and took a look at it, I thought, what the hell is a shapefile? I had never seen anything like this. I had no idea about anything like this. I had just been managing a site and been told that this was a new tool that could really help you to monitor what's going on in your protected area. But I had no idea. 
And so the second thing that struck me there was that once I started to reach out to the smart community, I was able to get such a wide range of support from people all over the place, not just in Zimbabwe, but reaching out to other countries in Southern Africa and then abroad. And so eventually I managed to bungle my way through and learn a little bit about the software. So fast forward to where we are today, and we've really tried to think about that. Think about protected areas where they don't necessarily get support directly from partners, directly from people who have been invested in the uh, development of the smart software and so on. And how can we continue to support people that might not have that access or might not even know where to start? And so a couple of years ago, we looked at the smart governance and divided it out a little bit to make sure that there was the inclusion of a capacity council. And so under that capacity council, we're looking at a number of things which I'd like to talk to you about today. And that is the smart approach, which Rich sort of touched on briefly there, the resources that we're developing, the overall community, the establishment of standards around the use of smart and for protected area management, and some of the training that's been going on um, through the partnership. So the smart approach. Now, Rich showed you this wheel, which has evolved over the years. The smart wheel is probably one of the first things that I ever saw and failed to understand. But once we started looking at it, um, you can get an idea of what we're trying to achieve here, right? So how many people here have done data collection before? Yep, a few, yeah, okay. I'd say a few have done data collection, okay. Data entry, whether it's tedious manual entry or using a device to collect information in the field, pretty straightforward process. As long as you know what you're trying to capture and what questions you wanna answer with that information, fairly straightforward, okay. People done analysis and reporting on that information, created a report, whether it's putting information into an Excel spreadsheet, generating a report, asked to put together an annual report or an incident report. How many people have done that? Yeah, about the same, okay. How many people have then spent all their time and effort on that report and it sat on a desk and never gone anywhere and never been utilized for anything? If your boss is in the room, just give me a quick little wave, whatever, that's fine, okay. And that is part of the adaptive management cycle that we see in so many places that the sort of buck stops there. You fail to close that loop because the feedback and evaluation process that comes from that report often never gets used for planning. It often never gets communicated back to those people in the field that are collecting information. So we wanted to know how can we continue to close that loop? And when you look at the actual adaptive management cycle, it's a little bit more robust than just that, okay? There's so many things to consider. Like, why are you collecting information in the first place? What is this actually going to be used for? How is it going to be beneficial, okay? Lots of places like to collect information on the numbers of, uh, uh, of patrols conducted and the number of kilometers that have been done. That's great, but how are you gonna utilize that? How is that beneficial for you? And how can you use that to actually make change and make positive impact within your protected or conserved area, okay? So understanding that management process and supporting protected areas to get a better understanding of how to use information to support decision-making is part of what we want to do within the partnership. And so there's been a couple of developments, some that are complete and some that are still ongoing. One that is due to be finished in early January, fingers crossed, is a management manual. And that's kind of similar along the lines of like a sort of good practices guideline in order of how to use SMART effectively as a manager, okay? Because that was missing before. And we realized that that's what a lot of people were requesting. People were saying, great, going out in the field, collecting data, we've had lots of training for analysts, so what? We're producing our reports, we're producing this information, it's great for donors, it's great because, you know, I'm working with one of the big bingos and they say that, you know, you need to be using SMART, so we're using SMART, but how is it beneficial? And that's really what we want to see is impact. So listening to the community and providing materials and support that can create direct benefits into improving management. So that includes also a number of best practice guidelines. 
Okay, we're starting to work towards those, again, listening to the community. What is the biggest needs? The smart partnership is generally made up of volunteers, volunteers who have day jobs, work in different organizations, but that have a direct link to a lot of these protected areas, to direct link to people that work in the field that can say, this is what we want. And that's part of the overall community. Coming at it from another level, we want to establish broader partnerships that are also working to support that adaptive management cycle, looking to create better practices within protected areas. One of the most sort of well-known of that is MET. So the MET, is everybody familiar with WET? MET, yeah? Okay, uh, it's gonna always get this acronym. The Monitoring Effectiveness Tracking Tool. Management, yeah, effectiveness tracking tool, that's the one. Acronyms, man, biggest killer in conservation. Um, so now SMART has been embedded in, to, or how to use SMART, I should say, has been embedded into MET4. So there's actually guidelines on how you can use SMART data to answer some of the questions that you might have through MET, okay? And we're looking at constant other opportunities. How can we support bodies like the World Commission on Protected Areas? How can we, you know, encourage better practices? And so best practice guidelines are another thing that we're really going to be working towards within the next year or so. And this means that we want to continue to contribute back to the software. So if SMART is not just the software, it's the entire approach, they need to be complementary. They need to be, you know, working back and forth. So whatever is developed as a new tool, a new resource, has to have that complementary resource in order to educate people on how to use it and why to use it and when and where and how it should be best applied. Okay, so with that, we're now developing a number of resources or have developed a number of resources as well, I should say, that are, again, freely available and accessible on the SMART website. That goes from your sort of straightforward technical training manual, which I implore anybody that's using SMART to download and to read, <laughs> you know, and to apply. Because one of the biggest challenges that I face as a trainer and as someone who works with a number of different uh, uh, SMART implementations around the world is when I go out there and I see the work that they're doing, I realize that they've never read the manual. You know, and it is one of those things that like any data platform, you get out of it what you put into it, right? Okay, good in, good out, bad in, bad out. And so these are readily available on the website. And we've got a number of other manuals that break down, you know, those specific components that Rich mentioned into sort of manageable size chunks. So if you wanna know how to best use the smart mobile application, for example, there's a separate manual available for that. There's quality assurance. There's how to use field sensors and profiles, okay? So those are all accessible within the SMART website on the resource library. And although SMART is a partnership again and predominantly made up of volunteers, we've really worked hard to access that community to try and ensure that whenever possible, we can have those manuals available in multiple languages. Okay, because that's really important for a community and when you want to build capacity within a community, a lot of the terminology used is not straightforward for non-English speakers, okay? But we do rely on the community and for people to contribute to that. So if you know anybody who's multilingual, please send them our way. Finally, we have been working on for a few years based on a successful trial um, and implementation of an online learning platform in South America. And the development of this has really been, um, you know, something that, that we've been striving for for a long time now. A self-learning, freely accessible platform where people can go online, take their time and work through how best to use the the software using that sort of modular focus so you can break it down into sizable chunks. You can go back, learn again, revisit those areas that you're struggling with. Okay. Anybody who's used smart before. Okay. The reporting function. It's fantastic for what it wants to do, but you really got to dig deep into how to utilize it. 
Okay? So having those tools that aren't just boring old technical manuals, but are actually a little bit more um, interactive, you know, online platforms that use videos, use imagery and everything to assist people in, in, in best learning, I think is gonna make a big difference going forward. And that is also slated for, uh, for public release, we're hoping in early January of next year. Now, I know a lot of people, as soon as you start talking about competences or competence register, their eyes kind of roll into the back of their head because they've seen those big laborious documents that make absolutely no sense. We've really tried hard to create more of a streamlined approach to, to competence, which breaks down those um, most important elements of smart use into different levels of users, which of course can be interchangeable, but what does your field ranger need to know in terms of data collection, okay? What is, the, what, what is the difference between being trained and actually being competent, right? And that's what you wanna be able to evaluate. And that goes all the way up to the level of the executive user, which is someone who will probably never access the software, probably never use it, but might be getting the reports, might be getting that information and might be the one that's actually creating the enabling environment on how to use SMART, okay? So then we're also looking at the tools that can support competence, which is the assessment platforms, okay? So how to assess. Extra support for the, your staff or your personnel using SMART. Um, this gives you the ability to set your own standards, to create specific job descriptions around the use of SMART, as well as curriculum for training. So moving on, we also have the SMART community, which engages with the SMART forum. If anybody's not a part of that now, I would suggest joining that because that's a great resource for accessing information. We have a number of uh, conferences coming up, which I'll mention in a moment. But of course, we've partnered with EarthRanger here, and you'll see that there's a, very, uh, a few different uh, smart um, discussions throughout the, the, the entire conference here. Also busy building out demonstration sites, sites where they're sort of best use cases, um, um, you know, sites of excellence where people who are interested in seeing how smart is, is, is being well applied can go and visit. Um, of course, we've got our lovely Elsabi here from Gonorejo, who's got one of the, the best applications that I know of. Um, we're building out focal points, you know, regional individuals, individuals who can actually be those sort of point of contact for, for SMART, and as well as supporting national adoptions and discussing, you know, making it easier for, for countries that want to nationally adopt SMART as a monitoring tool to do so. And so finally, we have been working this year to roll out a number of training events. Um, African-focused ones have been Kenya, Rwanda, Zambia, Madagascar, and a big portion of those were focused on adaptive management and the advanced use of data using a platform like SMART. So we're really trying to push forward, again, that, that capacity building element along with just using the software. So that's it from the Capacity Council. Um, I would just like to say coming up next year, we are going to have the first ever SMART Global Conference, or Congress. So if you'd like some more information about that, it's gonna be held in Namibia from the 10th to the 14th of March next year. And please reach out if you'd like to know some more. So thank you very much. Hey everybody, um, so we're almost at the end of this presentation. The last few slides I'm gonna go through are just talking a little bit about the, the kind of the future ahead for SMART um, on the technology side. Rich showed this uh, image early on. This is, gives you a full overview of all the technology functions within SMART. So it includes patrolling, it includes surveys, it includes the reporting, but many other features. And if you're interested in those detailed features, please just visit the SMART website for further information. To put in, in, in context, you know, why have we been so successful with SMART over the last 10 years? Why have we, 
When we started out 10 years ago or 12 years ago, we talked about getting to 100 sites. And, and now we're at 1,200 plus. And a lot of that success is down to the things that James mentioned, the fact that we've built a community of users that support each other, that we train and we focus not on the technology, but on the practice of conservation and on making sure we have a community of, of practitioners who are supporting each other. But the technology has had a role to, 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 to play in our successes as well. You know, the core of SMART, as, as what Rich mentioned, is that it focuses on the most broadly used approach for, for law enforcement globally. The approach where you send rangers out on a patrol, collect data, and then over time, optimize those patrols, making sure everywhere gets visited and the places where the threats are the highest get visited the most. It's also been successful because we've built a platform that's focused on making sure it's relevant to the local situation. And that's not just about making sure it can be translated in different languages and supports icons for limited literacy users, but also making sure it can run in a local office if, if the government requires uh, things to run within country. As Rich also share, showed, it has an incredibly powerful tool for modeling and querying data. So unlike some other tools where you just create individual forms, with SMART you create a, a large data model that covers every question you want to ask, and then from that you can generate unlimited forms. Having said that, the suite of a conservation technology tools has evolved in, in 12 years. You know, when we started out 12 years ago, it was easy for us to be the best tool out there because we were the only tool out there. Um, you know, and, and with our success, we've been we, we found that the demand is always 10 steps ahead of, of what we can provide. And so we're always adding new features, but we know that that's a challenge. And as part of that, we're committed to integrating SMART into a broader suite of tools. Last year, we, we released SMART 7. Uh, Rich mentioned some of those features, and just, 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 this just gives you an idea of, of how we are innovating year on year. SMART 7 included SMART Collect, a tool that allows a protected area to, to publish an application for collecting any type of data so that you can get communities, citizen scientists, or anyone who doesn't have a smart login feeding data into your system. We launched Profiles, the tool which showed you for creating these networks and, 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 and entities. We launched an integration to Gundi. I hopefully you'll all, you'll, you're all beginning to get familiar with what Gundi is, but basically with, through Gundi, we can now pull data from over 100 different sensors into smart. And what we've, we, we've just started releasing last week is Embedded Earth Ranger for Smart. And what Embedded Earth Ranger for Smart allows you to do is for all of our smart users who love and enjoy working with Smart but want to get some of those advantages that Earth Ranger provides, it allows them to pop up an Earth Ranger window from within Smart, view Earth Ranger data, but then ensure any data they add in Earth Ranger feeds back into Smart so they have all their data in one place. Looking ahead to next year, we're going to, we'll, we'll be releasing Smart 8. There'll be a number of features in that. A lot of those are, are going to be core enhancements to the application, upgrading the core plat platform, further integrations, and we're going to be in, releasing a, a new dashboarding tool uh, with advanced, more, even more advanced reporting. And then we're looking to, to release Smart X in, the, in, in maybe two years from now. That will be our first total rewrite of the platform. It'll have a richer mobile client. It will have extended dashboarding, more integrations, and will also focus on, on what is increasingly important, making sure these tools are easy to maintain. So that was a quick overview of where we're going with smart technology. I think now we'll just open it up to the floor for, for questions for any of us all. Thank you. from Namibia. Um, maybe I should just put it out there that uh, we're looking forward to hosting the next conference in Ventuk. So you're all welcome. Um, perhaps just a couple of questions and maybe a comment or two. Um, essentially, when I listen to this presentation and the one on Earth Ranger, uh, essentially, there seem to be a lot of similarities. Uh, are there any differences? Um, at management level, when my colleagues ask that we sign up for Earth Ranger, you know, what's the motivation? 
Uh, I'd like to get a bit more clarity on that. Um, then the second one is maybe a comment. Um, as we move along this trajectory of adaptive management, I think as governments, um, we are not really a lot amenable to all these new changes, technologies, and um, things that are a bit foreign. Um, we're a bit scared. At my level as director, um, I'll be honest, I'm shit scared at my stuff no more than I do. So um, perhaps one of the things that we ought to do um, at, at senior management, I think we 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 are more amenable to learn from other senior managers from other countries. If those kind of platforms can probably be availed, um, that's the one. And two, um, governments have their own protocols, standards, procedures, forms, and what have you. Now, my colleagues here are sitting with um, a challenge. They collecting all this information um, and they are analyzing it and they are putting it into a proper form. But at the same time, there is the standard government protocol, uh, forms for evaluation of staff, forms for uh, submission of monthly reports and so on. Uh, maybe the appeal from my side is, uh, as Namibia, if you could really have an in-depth look into these standard forms, that my colleagues have to complete and over a regular period submit to senior management. See how you can assist in that regard, um, just to make life easier for them, um, to lessen the workload on them as well when they are completing or preparing these forms. Um, I think let me leave it uh, at that for now. Thank you very much. Great. Well, let me let me um, let me start with that first question. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer a different one, but it was actually related to my daughter's homework last night. Um, so this is the answer I helped my daughter with last night. Uh, where they occupy different cleared niches. Um, you're right to push us on these things. Uh, Smart and Earth Ranger are can be complementary. But you could also implement them in the same location and basically mess up both things because they overlap and you have to think about how you're going to use them together. So they're both great tools, a large amount of overlap, but both with their own niches. Certainly, if you want to use, if your background is, is or if your focus is, is on the type of law enforcement that SMART was built for, sending out a patrol, running through the adaptive management cycle and optimizing over time, SMART is an excellent tool. And we have an approach with smart see them being as complementary. Um, so really, I think it, it depends on what your needs are. And it's, you know, I would, I would never find yourself in a situation where someone says they're, com they're, they're complementary, they can integrate, deploy them both. Because that's not good enough. You're right to ask that question. How are they complementary? How are they going to work together? And it takes a lot of thought. Running one system is complicated. Running two systems is, is often more than twice as complicated as running one. And so you have to think that through. Certainly for those organizations that are using SMART today, who are interested in being able to see you know, where the wildlife are in real time or integrating in-reach devices and, and having communications with their field staff about a, a live incident, even if that's procedures and processes around using Earth Ranger, but they're interested in the rich modeling that SMART provides, they need to think carefully through how they want to in integrate them together. So technically, they're integrated. Technically, they can work together, but it requires each individual site to carefully think through together with their SMART and Earth Ranger partners how and why to integrate them. And then, and then it actually, your, your comment wasn't a question, I know, but it, it raises a good issue, um, especially in terms of reporting. So as you say, a lot of governments have standard reporting systems that, are, that, that have to be followed. Um, and I think the challenge there is still providing the
reporting tools, standardized reports and forms and evaluations and so on were developed when there wasn't the capacity to do something like make a map or to calculate statistic very, statistics very easily. And so, um, so on the one hand, we absolutely, when you're deploying SMART or EarthRanger, you should work very closely to make sure that the, the government standards are met, but at the same time, don't let that limit you and take advantage of what is possible with these technologies that wasn't previously um, managing anti-poaching units. So I was running a protected area, you know, and, and utilizing this. And I can see the value of something like Earth Ranger immediately, how you can be able to see exactly where your teams are at any time, that link to communication, that real-time monitoring, that's incredibly valuable. And in terms of Ranger safety and so on, I think, you know, that that is definitely a direction I want to see a lot more protected areas going in. However, for me, the going on. So once we'd collected, you know, X amount of data, I was able to go back and say, guys, you know, what you were calling hotspots, they're not hotspots. It's just those are the only places you were patrolling. You know, this is, you know, you start collecting ballistic information from elephant carcasses and you start to see the patterns of like, well, these guys over here are using a completely different type of caliber to the ones that are being hunted over here. So how are we going to address this? It allows you to think about things from a more preventative standpoint as well, to apply different methods of, of protection. And so the value of, of each system, while complementary, I think are quite different and quite unique. So it's really about how it's applied. And you know, when you get staff that can can really apply some critical thinking to how these uh, systems are used, you can have a really, really strong um, complement to your protection model. Other questions? Just, just to add, is it working? I hope so. Just to add on his question, does it, link in with tablets also or is there a limitation that it's only on laptops or desktops um it's, uh, so you mean d does the desktop application run on a tablet you could run it on a window any report can run on any platform where you have a browser. Cool. One more question here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, my, mine is just an observation and a question. Uh, my name is Charles and I work with Kenya Wildlife Service. And basically mine is just to uh, support the infrastructure. Uh, my question is, uh, in terms of speed, do you recommend uh, a dedicated uh, bandwidth for this application to run uh, better? Because speeds are a bit of a problem, especially when it comes to... Uh, within the system and with that ranger you may need uh, maybe a tableau application to help with application with the analysis uh, why would i integrate the two what is the big gap that we are trying to fill by integrating the two given that the features are almost the same great great questions remind me the, the first question again was First question. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a challenge that we have with the Thranger, yeah. given the structure that we have. So I'm asking if you would recommend a dedicated link, and if it's a dedicated link, what is the capacity that would assist in running it adequately? 
Right. So, so smart was actually built built for uh, an occasionally connected environment. It was it was built for an environment where you where you couldn't have baron, bandwidth guaranteed, and where you had bandwidth, it was potentially quite a low bandwidth. So there are places that are running smart that don't have connectivity. Yeah, that have zero connectivity. They're collecting data, they're bringing it back to he headquarters, and they're analyzing it on, a, on their desktop. So you can run, run smart with zero connectivity. When it comes to the data collection, the, the mobile smack sends up very small packets of data. And so it, it can run over even like a 2G line if, if you want to send, send your data over that or uh, over, over Wi-Fi. When it comes to syncing data and, and viewing uh, data in, in Connect, if you've, got a, if you've got a connection that is good enough for you to browse fairly lightweight pages on the internet, it can, it, it, it can run Smart Connect. So the bandwidth requirements are very, very limited. You can run it without connectivity, and if you want to make use of the connected services, the bandwidth requirements are very, very limited. Of course, if you're in an office where you've got a one megabyte connection and 50 computers, any web page is going to be, going to be challenging. But basically, I think the key, key message is, is if, if you want to run smart and you don't have connectivity, you can do it. If you want to run it with Connect, you, you just need the kind of basic connectivity and it'll, and it'll work good enough. Cool. Um, the second connection uh, question is, you know, there's a big overlap between Earth Ranger and, and Smart. Why, why do we put the effort into integrating them? Um, you know, I think uh, uh, we have a shared vision with, with Smart, with Earth Ranger, which is to, to serve practitioners in the field. And we want to make sure you all have the best tools available to you. You know, maybe, maybe there's a future five years from now where there, where there is one integrated tool that is Smart and Earth Ranger together, who knows? But today we have two different tools that largely overlap but have some different benefits. From a Smart perspective, we know we can't build everything, and that's why we're integrating with Gundy. We know we're not, in the near future, going to be able to support you to track your giraffe in real time or your patrols in real time. And that's why we're integrating into Earth Ranger. So, in summary, we're Uh, thank you. I'm Abraham from Tanzania. Uh, we have smart sites there, and uh, we are using Connect in a local server. Uh, but currently, the management of protected area has been changed. Previously, the sites can sync the data straight from the site to the headquarters. But now, the, there is a zone office which is managed some sites. So, is it possible to do some configuration that the site instead of sync straight to the headquarter, they think to the zone office and the zone To reviewing before the data goes up centrally shouldn't be a problem. Cool. So I think we're out of time. Yep, out of time. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for the good questions. And we don't want to take these hats home, so please come get a hat if you want one.